I'd like to introduce Eileen Wiebeke, with whom we worked uh, many years ago in Borland. And uh, she was having a website named Web of Culture. Is it still alive? Yeah, so that's where you can find like a lot of very interesting and like, well, uh, amazing information about how different cultures uh, are perceived in uh, other cultures. So it's, so it's a big matrix. And now Eileen wrote a big, uh, like, hmm? Yeah. Yeah, now Eileen wrote this big and deep book with like very uh, long word that I tried to read. And well, so it's, it's worth reading, but it takes time. And so she came here to give a talk, so. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, can everyone hear me? OK. Um, I also have handouts for everyone. Let me just get those. OK, as Vladimir says, um, thank you for inviting me today, Vladimir. Uh, Vladimir and I have known each other for many years, starting back in uh, uh, Borland International about 10 years ago. And I'm going to give you a little background upon myself, and then we're going to go into the um, chat about uh, global business leadership and geo-leadership, basically how culture affects leadership and how leadership affects culture. So, and, um, so let's begin. So um, just a little background about myself. Um, my educational background, I have a BA in European Studies, a master's in um, international management, and a doctorate in management. And I concentrate on cross-cultural communications and on organizational leadership. Then I spent 20 years in corporate America in marketing and uh, management roles, 10 years here in Silicon Valley with uh, Borland International. Uh, I didn't put it up there, but the ill-fated Pointcast if anybody remembers Pointcast, <laughs> uh, Nobel, and Siebel Systems, which of course now is Oracle. <coughs> and then I have taught for the last few years doing teaching business management and organizational leadership courses at such schools at the University of Liverpool and at UC Santa Cruz. And um, if you would like, you can ask me questions if there's any words you don't un understand or any concepts you'd like explained. And then after the chat, you can also ask questions as well. OK? So let's begin. What I like to do in the beginning is sort of give everyone a flavor of how the term or the concept leadership is looked at in just other cultures and just in other languages. What are the words for leader or leadership? So for example, in German, the word is Führung, and that means guidance. And within corporations, it means consisting of someone who reduces the uncertainty in a situation. Then in Arabic, um, the word for leader basically is sheikh, and that means literally a man over 40. However, in the Gulf regions and in Saudi Arabia, it means a person from the royal family. But if you go to Egypt, it means a scholar of religion. So you can even see within certain regions, there are uh, wide variations in words. Um, in French, the word is conduite, and that means a leader is someone who guides one's own behavior and guide others, and they command action. And then if we go into Chinese, the character set for leadership is here, and that means the leader and the led. The leader is one who walks in front of the followers and guides the group by teaching the way. So as you can see, just around the world, there's just many different perceptions of leaders. So I really like this slide because um, then other people will say, well, in my culture, this is the word, and this is how we look at leadership. And especially when you look at a global corporation like Google, and you're working on global virtual teams, um, and maybe everyone takes a turn being the leader, you might have very wide results on when somebody from one country it takes a leadership role and somebody from the other one, another country, takes a leadership role. And even though you're all working on the same team for the same goal. OK, so for the purpose of this study, um, there are many, many differ different meanings or definitions of leadership. But for the purpose of this uh, discussion, leadership is what I've come up with is leadership is a relationship between the leader and the led for the management of resources through the vehicle of respect. Because at the bottom line, leadership is all about relationships. It's how people lead, how people follow. Then what is culture? 
Um, I recently gave a chat at an um, intercultural conference in Spain, and I probably saw 100 different de definitions of what is culture. Um, but for the purpose of this study, culture is somebody who perceives and deals with the world from a foundation of common linguistic and mental characteristics. So um, whether we know it or not or realize it, our national culture that we were brought up with affects how we make decisions. So culture, initially, I always say culture is one. Oh, I'm going to offer you. Oh, sure. Thank you. Like not stand right up. OK. Just, just hold this. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay, now we're more official. Okay. Oh, I sound better. Okay. Um, I always say culture is the one present that your parents gave you that you can't give back. Um, so what culture really does initially in your, in your life provides the survival tools to how you're going to interact with the world. And I call it your cultural comfort zone. So many people will say, well, I moved to another country, and I'm from, let's say I moved to Malaysia, and I'm from India, and let's, um, where can I find the best Indian restaurant? People want to know what's familiar to them. So I've deemed this um, the cultural comfort zone. And with my students to really get this point, drive it home, I ask them these three questions. I would say, where were you born? When were you born? And to which house were you born? And so I can just take myself, for example. My parents are from Ireland. My husband is from Germany. But I'm, my parents are from Ireland. But I was born and raised in Los Angeles. But um, if you can call it a bicultural existence, I was, even though I was raised in school in the United States, I still grew up in an Irish house. So it's crossing cultures constantly in your mindset. You know, you want to be true to a certain extent to the values you were given as a child, but then you realize, you know, but now I'm living and working in this culture, how can I be successful here? And I did some research when I um, was working in Silicon Valley. A lot of engineers um, basically were from Oracle, and they were from India, and I would say to them, when you have a big decision to make in your work or even in your life, um, upon what cultural values do you um, base it. Is it the um, native cultural values your parents gave you? Or is it the US values that you're learning? Or is it, let's say, the corporate culture of uh, Oracle? And they would say, well, you know, I try to encompass all three to see what's the best result that I can make. However, if there's a really important decision I don't know what to do, I would say 95% of the time, I will go back to the values my parents gave me. Because that's what I know, that's what I'm comfortable with, and that's sort of how I've uh, grew up to um, see the world. And I just find that very interesting because uh, more often than not, that's exactly what they say. It's um, basically, I think from the age of 10, there's a very famous researcher in terms of cross-cultural communications. He's Dutch. His name is Geert Hofstede. And his um, assumption or his thesis is that people's cultural values are ingrained in them by the age of 12. So um, I always talk about. Um, you know, what language do you pray in and what language do you count in? So say you were raised from the age of 12 in one culture, let's say you were raised in Kenya, but now you work in, live in the United States. These are, um, this, I say, what language do you count in? And they'll say, you know, I count in my native language, whatever that might be, because that's where I feel comfortable. So I call that the tripartite cultural variable, is the culture you grew up in, the culture you're living in, and also the organizational culture you're working in. And I'm sure here at Google, you see that every day. Okay. And then a term that came to be from this research is geoleadership. And geoleadership is leading across cultures and geographies. And it really shows how culture affects the bottom line. And I'm sure within the internationalization and localization fields, you see this all the time. Because you're obviously making it your product, and your system, your software, your coding. Um, at the end result, it has to be culturally acceptable and also logical for someone who you know, you may not have the same language in common or whatever. So that's what geo-leadership has evolved to, ma uh, to mean. OK. Now, global business leadership is if you, um, you have a handout here. This will go into the model here on the other side of the card. Here is a handout. And then what we're talking about is this book here that came out a couple months ago. It's published by Elsevier in Oxford, England. And the, the research study that the data um, initially was set on in the book 
uh, was a doctoral dissertation. The, all the data from the study of this research is in chapter 10 of the book. And what, we're, what we try to do is put in the research and then apply to case studies. And what I've done for the case studies today, I have quite a few, but I mainly chose technology companies because we're at a technology company today. There's, I have lots of examples, but I wanted to make it more relevant to what you're working on today. So if you want more uh, information on it, this is a website that you can go to. And Ashley, Vladimir, I'll give that to you if you want to pass it around if anybody wants to take a look at it. OK. So again, that goes into the geo-leadership model, which you see on the back of the card. Um, the research came up with seven key competencies that US, basically um, uh, for the United States, that US business leaders need to know and how to compete in the global marketplace. And there were seven key competencies that came about from this study. And they are capability, care, change, communication, contrast, consciousness, and context. We'll go into each one of those, and then uh, I have several case studies for those as well, so you can see them more illustrated. This is a model. If you go to the website globalbusinessleadership.com, you mouse over the model as well. You'll see the competencies. You'll see a brief description. And when you mouse over, you'll see an even more in-depth description of each competency. OK, so the more details about the study was this. It was the first ever web-based Delphi study focusing on intercultural leadership competencies. And the way people were chosen for this study were that they had to have at least 10 years of intercultural experience in either consulting or teaching or writing. They had to have published at least one book on intercultural communication. They had to be fluent in English, because the survey was in English. And they had to get access to the internet because it was done online. And they, because it was a Delphi study, one of the uh, protocols for that is that they did not know each other. I, only, I was the only one that knew who they were. So if you look at the bottom line for this, these were people who are experts in uh, cross-cultural communications and in business. And we were talking to them about leadership. And through their work, what, um, what are the competencies that business leaders need to have going forward? So the participants, right now, there is 26 participants. For a Delphi study, you're looking at between 25 and 30. And so we had 26. We're very happy. Um, and this is the breakdown of the questionnaires they answered. And there were 11 women, and there were 15 men, and they were from six of the seven continents. So we had a really wide variety of people, which is very good. So the research design, if you're not quite familiar with the Delphi study, what a Delphi study does is there are three rounds of questions. And we'll go through the questions um, going forward. But what you want to do is you want to go to them and say, here's my question. What are the, you know, the competencies US business leaders need to have going forward in terms of culture? And then you ask them three rounds of questions. You give them the first round, they answer it. You distill the information. The software used for that is in vivo, analytical software for qualitative surveys. Then from that, those answers, you give it back to them. And you say, this is what you all said the first round. Now, do you agree with this? Do you want to change anything? What do you think? Then they answer it again. You distill the information again. You give it back to them one more time. And at the end of the three rounds, then that is your data set that they have all come to have a consensus upon. So what Delphi study does is it gets consensus among a group of experts for a particular question. And that's why this was um, the methodology used for this study. Um, the Delphi study, or rather methodology, was pioneered at RAND Corporation in the 1950s in Southern California. So RAND, as you may know, is a large think tank in California. So. <coughs> Again, we're going back to the main question that they all had to answer is, what are the intercultural leadership competencies for US business leaders in the era of globalization? And to arrive at that final answer, they had to ask, uh, rather answer a series of questions. So, and then from those questions, the answers that came about were these. So the first, basically, we asked was, um, 
what, uh, can, what competencies can they learn to develop to compete globally? And the very first one they said, the leaders have to be self-aware. And so in terms of, then that translates into the geo-leadership competency of consciousness. So as a leader needs to be self-aware of their own cultural background and their own bias. And we'll go into case studies going forward and you can see where sometimes where the leaders did that or companies did that or sometimes they didn't. Um, for this particular case here, it means a geo leader must expand their consciousness because everything's changing around them in a very fluid environment, especially virtually at the speed of technology. So the example, this is a new example I have um, and it's of course from Silicon Valley. I think Facebook is just across the street. Um, but it's Facebook in my, and MySpace in Japan. And I'm not sure if you've heard about this. Um, so Facebook and MySpace tried to go into the Japanese market or have been trying to go in there for about the last year or so. Um, however, in Japan currently, there is a large social networking site called Mixi, which is strictly Japanese. I mean, it's not an export from the United States. It's, it's an in-country product. And what's happening with Facebook and MySpace is they're having a lot of problems uh, trying to tackle or uh, get into the ja uh, Japanese market. I mean, they're there, but they're not being as successful as the in-country version of a comp uh, the, uh, fa net uh, the network called Mixi. So what happens is what MySpace and Facebook have come to realize is that communication in Japan, is a lot of it is very nonverbal. So they went in, basically, they took their US versions, and they plopped it in Japan, and they said, OK, this is how we do it in the US, and we'll localize the language. But we're not really going to take a sort of a 360 degree view of it and look at some of the cultural variables that are very important. That a lot, as we know too, a lot of this stuff is unseen, it's unspoken, but it exists. So what Facebook, the CEO of Facebook said, you know, Facebook is so um, unique in that we use people's real names and their photos and profiles so they can network with each other, kind of like LinkedIn. LinkedIn now has photos. Um, but in the Japanese culture, more often than not, the web users are trying to avoid this sort of direct you know, um, emphasis on the individual, where it's more of a collectivist culture. So um, but with the Mixi uh, network, they already have a high trust and it's invitation-based social network. And it's all, in terms of it, it's already sort of culturally maximized for, the, uh, for Japan. So uh, it was the in-country localized version um, of something that wasn't a US export. Um, but, but also Facebook and MySpace failed to, um, even on the business side, failed to realize is that they didn't offer an optimized version for Japanese phones, for handsets. And in Japan, the mobile web is much bigger than the PC web. So the bottom line here, Facebook and MySpace are losing market share still because they're not recognizing their own cultural bias. They're not saying, you know, uh, we're from the US and we're going to go in there and we're going to try to change things. It's more, you know, we're from the US, we're going to go there, we're going to try to figure out how we're going to do this correctly according to the culture there. So that is consciousness. And this is just, I just put up um, a screenshot of Mixi right now. And I actually, I didn't have the one for Facebook. It's very, very simple at Facebook. But this, um, a Japanese colleague of mine was telling me that when he saw Facebook Japan, he saw Mixi, he said right away, he just felt more comfortable with the Mixi version of the social networking idea. Um, because he could tell that it was more in tuned with what he understood. So, and, that, and that's just not the translation either. So the next one is, can US business leaders, how can they recognize the concept of culture? And what the expert panel said is, you have to have cultural immersion. You have to go, you have to live, work, be in that culture. You just, when I worked um, for a couple of companies here in Sil uh, Silicon Valley, they thought they could manage the world from a cubicle in San Jose. They never really wanted to go to the country. They never really wanted to interact in country. And so what this sort of, cultural immersion goes into is the idea of care. It's balanced interest. So you're looking at profit and stakeholders, but you're doing it through respecting and mutual understanding of each other. And so, of course, bottom line for any business is to make profit, but you want to retain profit while still serving others. And 